shut up and sit down. All right. So I'd like to introduce Jay Nugent, WB8TKL, and the title of his talk is The Homogeneous AmperNet Data Network. I like homogeneous, but I'm into milk. Well, as he said, homogeneous uh, AmperNet data network. I'm Jay Nugent, WB8TKL, out of Ypsilanti, Michigan. And everybody can spell Ypsilanti, right? Okay, good. Uh, for this presentation, by the way, there is a dress code. Clothing is optional, so feel free to get comfortable. All righty. I, uh, I serve as an ass uh, assistant section manager for the uh, uh, Michigan section. Uh, my responsibility is uh, digital technologies. And I also served way back in the early days of Tapper as a beta test coordinator. Anybody remember beta test coordinators? Back when the first beta boards came out before the Tink one? Yeah, that was circa 1982. We actually didn't get any boards in our hands until 1983. And that was back when Den Connors was in charge. Anybody remember Den Connors? A few of you are really old. Okay, that was before Lyle Johnson took over. So anyway, uh, the homogeneous uh, AmperNet data network, um, we'll uh, do a little insight here into the capabilities of using packet radio combined with some various automatic routing protocols, uh, such as uh, NetROM and some static IP routing uh, in JNOS nodes uh, using NCAP route tables. And we use this all to go and pass data all around the state and all around the world. And this includes being able to pass TCP IP over the air end-to-end uh, -end over the amateur airwaves. So what is homogenous? Homogenous, a uh, similar, comparable, equivalent, and so forth. I like to just refer to it as milk. You know, things are mixed really, really well, and, uh, and, and it, it becomes a homogenous state. So you don't see all the little bits that are floating around inside. They just all kind of blend together. And that's what we like about networks. So, packet. Isn't that what Tapper used to do? Is Tapper still doing anything packet? <laughs> I don't think so. They've moved on to other cool stuff, and that's okay. But for your information, AX25 is still very much alive and well, as is JNOS. Uh, they're not dead, Jim. We see them all over the place. Uh, Bob Brenenga is here. He'll, of course, attest to APRS is alive and well. Um, NetROM, how many folks actually use NetROM back in the day? That is still around. Uh, Software 2000 put that out way back in 84, 85 time frame. And it's still chugging, chugging away and being used quite a bit in, uh, in, in particular in BPQ nodes. How many folks are running BPQ? Anybody? Several. Tom in the back. I knew Tom's hand was going to go up. Uh, a lot of data uh, uh, can be moved NetROM to NetROM, but as TCP IP um, using what we call IPNR. This is running IP over the top of a NetROM network. It just looks like a neat little pipe from one point to another, and you don't care what's in between. And we pass IP over the top of that using the NetROM nodes as the MAC addresses of each end of the link. It just looks like an Ethernet. How sweet. A lot of data can be moved at 1,200 baud. Don't get us wrong. You know, uh, a lot of folks uh, sit back, they wait, they want to go and see a really, really fast uh, network uh, get built up. That's all fine and well, but how many here have deployed microwave up on top of their local 1,000-foot towers or big buildings? It doesn't happen all that often, though we've got a pretty, uh, pretty kick-butt uh, microwave network here in Michigan right now. But it, it doesn't happen for general you know, Joe Blow ham. So being able to still do 1,200 baud, it's greater than zero bits per second. Anything greater than zero bits per second is a good thing, especially when there's an emergency. And those of us that lived through the 80s and the 90s know that a lot of data got moved at 1,200. AX25 is indeed a link layer protocol. It is meant as point-to-point -point only. This is not unlike IP and TCP IP. It is a point-to-point -point only protocol. Other things make it go through hops and so forth. And of course, with AX25, digipeters were the band-aid solution that was built into the protocol 
to allow us to go and use digi uh, to digipeat packets. That was intentionally, and even said in the original protocol spec, one point, version 1.0, that it was indeed a quote-unquote band-aid. Um, digi uh, stepped off my track here. Okay, uh, despite one quarter of the 44 stroke eight IP address space in the 44 network uh, being sold off to Amazon uh, by the ARDC, we still have plenty of IP address space available for anything and everything we want to do. Uh, how many folks in the room hold some portion of the 44 address block assigned to them, whether it be a single stroke 32 address or more? So there's still a pretty good representation here. Um, selling off that address space, personally, I was kind of ticked off when it happened. I know a lot of folks were. I feel that it was actually the right move. It meant that a bunch of addresses that somebody saw value in, which that value probably won't be around 10 years from now, no one, no one will be interested in IPv4, but while it had value, ARDC unloaded a portion of it that wouldn't hurt the amateur community. In exchange, there's a whole bunch of professors and students that are in this room because of the money that was made on that sale. And the interest from the money in the, uh, on that sale is going to continue to fund a lot of emerging ideas and technologies well into the future. So, let's get some color on the screen. How many here are familiar with the OSI seven layer model? A lot, oh my God, I love you all. Well, I love 75% of you. <laughs> anyway, um, obviously with packet radio, the radio was the physical layer. It was the thing that moved the tones, uh, simulated a wire and so forth. Um, the link layer, the next layer up, layer two, uh, that's where AX25 sits in the uh, OSI 7 layer model. I'm going to switch glasses because I'm having difficulty reading my own notes. I still look the same? Handsome goodness? Okay, great. Um, in the link model, of course, uh, that, uh, that's where we go and take care of things like the basic framing, the clocking, and so forth. We all remember our V92 modems when we dial into AOL and all that funny stuff that was going on. The, the modems were doing a process called training. They were learning what the clock rate was, they were learning what the bandwidth was, and in the case of packet radio with Bell 202 modems, they just needed to go and get the clock synced up. We'll cover a little bit more of that in, uh, in a moment. But this is where uh, addressing, uh, framing, and so forth uh, uh, take place. Up at layer three, we have the uh, packet or network layer. This is also point to point from one router to another, or one node to another. And this is also where IP will take place uh, between any two nodes. We don't finally get up to layer four until we're ready to actually route something. This is the uh, transport layer. Thing, or, I'm sorry, layer three, routing takes place. Routing four, transport layer, this is where the application is talking to the node, saying, I've got this WinLink message, can you send it? or I've got this text message from my keyboard, can you send it? Goes out through 123, back down 321, over a link, up 123, down 321, over another link, up 1234, we've reached transport layer again, and it gets handed off to the destination. It's a pretty neat system, and when you compartmentalize each of the different um, logical steps that has to take place, the OSI model makes a, a whole lot more sense. Moving on. We're only going to go and cover the iframe in the, in the AX25 uh, protocol definition. And for those that are interested in what the full definition says, you can go uh, Google for AX25 link access protocol specification version 2.2. But the basic framing that goes on within an, uh, an AX25 frame, they're really not packets, they're frames. We send a uh, seven easy hex. This allows the two modems on either end to sync up. When we assert push to talk on our radio, we're already sending a whole stream of seven easies. Um, this allows the transmitter to actually start putting out some RF. It allows the receiver at the other end to capture that signal and to sync up the modem on, on its end. So we send this 
and uh, uh, as a stream of seven easies to get the clock synced up. Um, the, as I said uh, earlier, this is what's called training. Uh, this is also that time when TX, delete, uh, TX delay in your, in your uh, uh, old TNCs, that was that, what that setting was for us. How long am I going to key up before I transmit data? Immediately after the seven easies, we start sending the to address, the from address, the digipeter call signs that we might be going through with our SSIDs. As I mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation, the call signs are actually used as the MAC address. Just like on 802.3 Ethernet, the, the, uh, your uh, call sign SSID is the MAC address of each end of a link. We then go and have an octet that's used for the control field, set asynchronous balanced mode, connect request, uh, disconnect, receiver ready, receiver not ready for doing some flow control of the data across the link, uh, unnumbered information, disconnect mode. And those, those last two I listed there, NR and NS, those are three bit counters. And those are used to go and count up to seven, for those of you that remember your base two binary. Uh, we were allowed to go and have seven packets out on the fly at any one time and then have one acknowledgement come back that says receiver ready and account number says, oh, I, I acknowledge everything uh, up to that number. But the main thing I was getting to here is where is the PID? And the PID is the protocol ID. The protocol ID is where we go and identify what is going to be contained in the next field. Now, most people always think of, oh, well, you know, when you send out a packet, it just goes out, and your data is contained in the, in the data field, and it's data. But does that data need to then be processed up through a NetROM processor? Does it need to go up through a TextNet processor? Does it need to go into an IP stack, et cetera? So we need to go and tell the, uh, the, the far end what PID we're going to be using. Then we actually contain the actual information and data itself, uh, the, uh, uh, the data is uh, going to be, in the case of using higher level protocols, that data field is going to now contain layer 3 information encapsulated into this layer 2 frame. We then go and follow it up with a frame check sequence, which is a cyclic redundancy count of everything following the last 7 easy that was sent at the beginning and ending with the very last uh, uh, bit of the octet stream in the data field. Uh, with that, we can then go in and do some uh, forward error correction and acknowledge whether a uh, packet was damaged in any way. It's a 16-bit CRC, and then we end with a 7-easy hex because, hey, why not? We were using them before. We might as well end it with that. So everybody got a feel for what an iframe looks like? Okay. So that PID field... A lot of folks never really grasped this too well when, I, when we were doing packet in the 80s and 90s. Um, the PID field would have a FOX0 in it. That just meant there is no layer 3. This is just a plain old AX25 frame, what APRS would use, um, keyboard to keyboard mode, uh, you know, chatting with your friends or doing whatever. Um, no additional networking was, was built in. This is plain Jane AX25 only. However, if the PID was set to Charlie Foxtrot, that meant that what's in the data field is going to be NetROM protocol. And then we're into a whole new protocol specification and how that works. We're not going that deep. Don't worry. I saw some eyes roll back in the heads. But Charlie Foxtrot means the, uh, the data field contains NetROM information. Charlie 3 means that it contains uh, TextNet information. And uh, who here remembers TextNet? Ooh, yeah, okay. Tom does. Tom knows real well. Tom McDermott, right? Yeah, Tom McDermott designed the hardware for TextNet. And his sidekick, Tom Oschenbrenner, did I get the right name? Okay, Tom Oschenbrenner did all the software. And it was awesome. It was assembly code on a Z80. And man, I dug my head into that, and I had a ball finding out how this stuff worked and how it did self-healing routing and, and stuff like that. It was an awesome, awesome system. And then Greg Jones got involved in it uh, back then as well. 
uh, good fun time. Here in Michigan, and Tom Bosher in the, in the back will remember this, we, uh, we took TextNet, we renamed it, we called it GLNet for Great Lakes Net, and we had nodes all over uh, parts of Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Remember those good days, Tom? He shakes his head, yeah, and the pain that went along with it. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then of course, if you do a, a, a PID of Charlie Charlie, uh, that was uh, IP. We're now gonna run IP, and what runs over the top of IP? I love you guys, and what else? UDP, and what else? Yeah, and what else? Everything. That was the word I was looking for, and it, was, it took a little pulling it out of you, but I knew you could do it. Um, ARP. We all use ARP. Those of us that do TCP IP work, we understand ARP. We know why it's there. It's only used in IPv4, not in IPv6, because in IPv6, it's smoke and mirrors, gang. But uh, uh, IPv4 uses ARP, so of course, being a protocol unto itself, they needed to go and write it into the uh, PID field of the AX25 uh, fr info frame. So the ARP protocol was defined. And then, how many folks here have done FlexNet? Me neither. I hear about it, I read about it, I find stuff, you know, I Google for it. There's all sorts of stuff about FlexNet, and I've never run into anybody other than on the, I think in California, they use it or something. Anyway, but what protocol is going to be contained inside that iframe uh, is defined by the, by the PID. So, moving on to more interesting stuff. Don't worry, we won't get into any, any more uh, deep protocol stuff, and that was hardly deep. Uh, in Michigan, we basically have four different data communications networks for amateur radio. Uh, there's the TCP IP AmperNet, a lot of that runs on uh, JNOS or HAM gates that are JNOS nodes that have NCAP route tables on them. Um, they're primarily linked via uh, internet and RF links. I know here in, south, in uh, District 2 South, which is the three counties making up the most southeast cor uh, corner of the state, we're all RF. However, we're all very slow RF. But for the amount of traffic we need to move, and how often we have emergencies. I mean, it's a tornado state after all. We don't have earthquakes, we don't have floods, we don't have uh, hurricanes. Um, but our, uh, our data needs are fairly low, but uh, uh, we're getting away with some slow uh, RF links at the moment, but we're working on solutions to improve that. Anyway, uh, I will jump in, because many times I'm gonna remind folks that JNOS now supports WinLink RMS. Uh, Mako Langelier in Canada, who supports JNOS, uh, uh, did me a favor after a little bit of badgering, and he wrote it in. It was a project he worked on a couple of years back and let die. Now it's in the uh, JNOS code, so uh, we're, we're happy to see that. The other network that we've got going on is BPQ. Uh, how many folks here said that they ran BPQ? I thought there were several. Okay. Uh, BPQ can be BQ, BPQ32 running on a Windows box or LinBPQ running on Linux. Um, these nodes are also linked with one another via AXUDP links over the internet or via RF. And of course, BPQ uh, uh, supports WinLink RMS. The third network is the MI7 BPQ network. Same as the other BPQ guys, except they've got it a little easier, I think. The, uh, the MI7 BPQ nodes are linked via the MI6 microwave network. Um, and of course, being BPQ, they also support uh, uh, WinLink RMS. And if I've got it right, MI7 was mostly uh, deployed so that people could do WinLink easily throughout the state as it's uh, one of its primary purposes. And then the uh, fourth network is indeed the MI6 microwave network based on mi uh, Microtik microwave nodes on 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz. They also provide uh, Wi-Fi access on those uh, two bands uh, to anybody who can reach one of the nodes. And uh, MI, MI7's now up to, I believe, 15 nodes in their, uh, in their network. We'll see a map of that in a little bit. Uh, but folks that are close enough to one of the MI, uh, MI7 sites can access the MI6 microwave from their homes. If you've got a clear shot, 
antennas above the trees, and, uh, and you point your, uh, your dish in the right direction. I don't do CW, so I don't know what that was, John. <laughs> I'm assuming that was your phone. I've heard it before. Anyway, so uh, how do we use these networks? Well, we use them, to obviously, to move data from point A to point B. That's what networks do. This is why anything greater than 1,200 or greater than zero bits per second is good, and we can live with 1,200, but we prefer higher speeds. Uh, we do a lot of uh, you know keyboard keyboard communications uh, all across the state, as well as there are chat servers on all of the BPQ nodes, and they're all interlinked. You're going to log into any BPQ node in the state and get on a conference channel and somebody can be on that same conference channel on a different BPQ node on the other end of the state, and the two of you can talk. Uh, there are several nets that take place. I know of three nets that occur on a regular schedule here in the state on, uh, on two different BPQ networks, BP, uh, the BPQ and the MI7 BPQ. And then on JNOS, we also have the Converse server, which uh, any of the JNOS nodes running TCP IP uh, operate. And the neat thing there is, is people can telnet in on port 3600 to a ham gate and gain access to the conference bridge without ever having a radio. And that has been very useful. Uh, we also do such things as move NTS traffic, status reports, resource requests, ICS forms. Who here is burdened with their local county or state requiring them to do NIMS and pass ICS forms for, for MCOM traffic? You're not that much of an MCOM crowd, I get. <laughs> this presentation was originally put together for uh, the uh, FEMA DHS Interop, Interoperability Conference last February in Traverse City. I had to do this with all the technical stuff stripped out and do the presentation mostly geared towards the, the paid first responders and the folks that build the networks around the state and wanted a backup. Anyway, so we also move ICS forms uh, to and from the state EOC in Lansing, neighboring EOCs and neighboring counties, and, and work with uh, various NGOs such as Red Cross and Salvation Army. Of course, text and NTS messages are easily done in plain AX25. You don't need a real fancy network for that. But uh, uh, the JNOS network also supports the moving of SMTP email. I write an email at my node addressed to someone at another node. It goes out from my node direct to their node over the network, gets delivered into their inbox. When you send WinLink messages, do they go directly to the recipient? No. They get held in a, in a post office server or they get held in a CMS server. And how does the recipient know that he's got mail coming in? He has to fire up his WinLink station, log in, check to see if there's mail, and pull it down. So it's not instant delivery, unlike SMTP. Uh, we, uh, we do uh, support things like uh, FL Message and Outpost, uh, WinLink Airmail Express, and then the one that I like the most for uh, WinLink is a program called PAC, P-A-C. Uh, anybody use PAC? Nobody. Oh, it's awesome. Easy to install on Linux. AX25 tools, you get those going, do a kiss attach, and, uh, and you're up and running. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, really uh, it's not a bloated program in any uh, stretch of the imagination. But all of these uh, programs I've mentioned do support uh, custom ICS forms because in every state, the incident command system forms are always different. Most important thing about these four networks is they are deployed by three different organizations, all with the intention that anybody can use them any day, day, night, time of day, whatever, with one exception, and that is to please stand down your traffic if there's an emergency or a drill going on at that time. And we found hams are really, really good about that. They can, they can burden the network, play with things, experiment, transfer files, have a good time, and then when there's a drill or an exercise, They'll just go do something else for that day, or they'll be involved in the exercise. But uh, these networks are not just for MCOM. They're uh, intended for daily use by uh, Joe and Jolene Ham. Anybody know Joe and Jolene? Really, really nice couple. We built whole networks just for those two so they could chat. 
Really sweet pair. Anyway, um, but what this does for us by having everybody use the network anytime they want for anything uh, guarantees that we end up with a pool of trained and equipped operators to draw upon in times of need. Because if we only built a, an MCOM data network and nobody used it daily, we wouldn't have anybody that knew how to use it and we wouldn't have anybody with home stations ready to hook into it and use it when, they, when something is, uh, when, when the stuff hits the fan. So uh, you definitely want to have a, a trained pool of operators. More color, yay! This was a map I put together of the, uh, the Michigan uh, uh, JNOS uh, TCP IP network, the Michigan AmperNet, back in May of 2007. It continued to grow. At that time, we had on the order of about uh, uh, 22 ham gates and key stations in EOCs, Red Cross facilities, um, uh, Dale Williams, WADFK, the Great Lakes Division Director. He had a packet station, at, a JNOS station at his home. Um, had a lot going on at that time. Um, I never had enough time to go and come up with a, a newer map because over the next uh, few years, things grew to be about 25% larger than what you see here. Um, at that point in time, we had an RF footprint that covered about 70% of the lower peninsula of Michigan. You could drive somewhere in your car, put up a 30-foot mast, and always find a packet station that would get you back into the network. That was awesome. I used to keep a station on the, on the passenger seat of my van and monitor the various nodes as I was drive from southeast Michigan up, up to uh, Traverse City. Uh, a number of things cause the pendulum to swing. We've all experienced the pain of you build up something really, really cool, really, really big, and then the people involved end up with things like health issues, divorces, retirement, move away, lose interest. Their antenna blows down and they don't want to be bothered putting it back up. Any number of things cause the interest to uh, disappear, and the pendulum swung to where we... Uh, we were down to just a few nodes. This is as of uh, this past December. Um, the network is continuing to grow up. This is just the, uh, the JNOS-based nodes. We'll cover the other nodes and other maps here in a moment. But on this network, users can connect in. Uh, it's, uh, the JNOS nodes support uh, NetROM, so the BPQ nodes can sign in. They support TCP IP, so other JNOS nodes can sign in, and anybody with a plain old TNC could uh, sign in and then get anywhere they want to go anywhere in the network, including the network is tied to the worldwide uh, uh, I, uh, Amper net. So you want to go and uh, chat with somebody in, in London, England, or London, Ontario. It didn't matter. It reached both of them. The network is designed around 44.102 addresses, and we assigned... Uh, a, a number of stroke 44 uh, subnets in each county based on the amateur radio population in each of those counties. Uh, Jeff King, WBWKA, and I sat down and went through a lot of data to go and figure out how many addresses we'd allocate to each county. And that way people knew what, what subnet they belonged in, they knew what address they should ask for when they were, when they were getting coordinated. Um, because it's TCP IP, it carries the entire TCP IP suite of protocols. Um, everything that doesn't require SSL, because why don't we pass SSL? Part 97 doesn't, uh, doesn't allow encryption. You know, things can't be hidden. So, um, but doing FTP, Telnet, SMTP, ping, ICMP. Uh, JNOS also has a web server built into it. Um, we've used, we used to use that uh, up in Midland County. We had a guy that would grab the National Weather Service radar, neck down the, uh, the image to as small as he possibly could, getting it down to just you know, 3 or 4K in most cases, put it on a web server, and we could pull it down in a matter of 30 seconds to a minute at 1,200 baud. So when you needed a weather map and you weren't somewhere where you could get one, uh, of course, nowadays, everybody carries a web browser in their hand, and uh, everybody here is equipped with a smartphone, right? Not me. I got a flip phone. But, uh, <laughs> so I could still use that. 
<laughs> anyway, but it carries all of the, you know, all the protocols. So once you've built up an, an IP-based network, it just plugs into everything off the shelf like, you, like you'd want, and you can do some awesome stuff. Oh, and did I mention that JNOS now supports WinLink RMS? So then we've got the MI7 BPQ network. Uh, MI7 is uh, their primary purpose uh, was to go and uh, provide access to the, uh, to the WinLink RMS nodes. Uh, within their network, and their network's now up to about 15 nodes, uh, within their network they have five WinLink RMS relay or Telnet uh, post office servers. So if there were an internet outage here in Michigan, the folks that are on, that, on this uh, network can get to the post office servers locally within the state and never leave the state or ever touch the public internet at all. Am I correct on that, Tom? Okay. Um, and I'm assuming, and I've never confirmed this, I should ask you, these post office servers do talk to the CMS servers when they've got a connection? Okay. All righty. The... Um, each of these nodes has a 2 meter and a 70 centimeter uh, port as well as uh, microwave access for end users. So that's really handy depending on what radio uh, you've got, where you happen to be. Uh, you can get into any one of them and be able to go anywhere and do anything. It does not do dishes or wash windows. The first of the uh, MI7 nodes was installed in Saginaw back in uh, July of uh, uh, 2018. So this is... Uh, they're growing really, really fast. And they're all tied together. Whoop. Well, that one will work. They're all tied together uh, uh, with a microwave network. This is a compilation uh, map that was put together by our section emergency coordinator, John McDonough, WB8RCR. Um, the red nodes are JNOS or Hamgate nodes. The purple are MI7 BPQ nodes. The green ones are just plain BPQ nodes, uh, not part of MI7. I think the blue ones, as I check through this, they all appear to be EOCs, Emergency Operations Centers, for individual counties uh, throughout the state that were packet equipped. And then the yellow uh, nodes uh, on the list are not part of the data network, but they happen to be uh, well-known uh, WinLink HF stations in the state. After all, the section emergency coordinator needs to know where his resources are, so that's why he built, uh, built that fine map for us. It is now approaching a year old, so there's a lot more dots we can put on that. Anybody notice a pattern of where all these things are, all these dots are, all these balloons? They're, they're along the coasts. They're in around Lansing, southeast Michigan, Detroit. There should be a whole lot more around Kalamazoo because I know there are people in Kalamazoo. And there's several more uh, balloons that should be in and, in and around uh, uh, Grand Rapids. But uh, they're primarily where all the population is. You might notice there are some big green forests in the middle of this, uh, all up in the upper part of the uh, lower peninsula and through the upper peninsula. And those, people don't live there. That's, that's for the deer and the antelope for them to roam. Oh, we don't have antelope. The MI... Question? We have elk. We have elk. Yes, we have big elk. Don't hit them with your car. It's worse than a deer. MI6 microwave network is a uh, backbone made up of microtick microwave nodes uh, and a... There are some wired data circuits, and, uh, and I don't know if they're still in place, but there had been some LTE cellular broadband uh, connections, and uh, Fred had uh, alluded to some of the connections were even fiber optic. Um, so we end up with some pretty high-speed connectivity on the MI6, mi MI6 microwave. Uh, originally, the MI6 uh, microwave network was deployed for the MI5 DMR network tying a number of DMR repeaters all around the state together, all with non-telco infrastructure. What does that mean to us? Phone company loses a cable, loses power, whatever. Our DMR repeaters all remain connected to one another. Um, there are advantages to not using the internet when, uh, when something goes wrong. As I said before, 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz uh, access for uh, users. Typically, you need to be line of sight. A uh, microwave doesn't go well through trees, which puts you in the 10-mile range for, for good connectivity. There are folks that have far exceeded that. When you do connect via the microwave, uh, a microwave access, 
It'll serve up a 44.103 address to you via DHCP. And he, uh, uh, Fred and the CMEN group have uh, real fine instructions on their webpage how to set that up. They have a number of pop locations, and when I wrote this slide, I had no idea where they all were, and then I did sort of a V8 this morning as I was driving over here and realized, oh, wait a minute, the uh, MI6 network has a, a, a web page where they're monitoring each of their microwave nodes and the status of it, and I can just look at the, the city names, and I'd know all the cities that the, that the sites are in. So I'll update that slide before the next time I do this. Interoperability. This is kind of the whole point of these four networks. They all carry traffic, but none of them are a walled garden. Everybody's familiar with the term walled garden? Yeah, you don't want things that are just islands unto themselves. Because uh, we want to uh, you know, foster the ability and collab uh, yeah, the ability to foster collaboration with open interoperable protocols that work just fine across organizational boundaries. You might have picked up here, we've got three different organizations going on. We've got the TCP IP JNOS network, AmperNet. We've got the, M, uh, the BPQ nodes owned and operated by individuals, and we've got the MI7 BPQ nodes. So there are three different organizations, but they all talk NetROM, and many of them, the MI6 and the, uh, and the AmperNet, talk TCP IP within the 44Net. So there's a lot of good connectivity uh, through, throughout the, uh, these four networks. So four networks, two protocols, easy to manage. We avoid walled gardens, with the exception there is one ham gate in Midland who just never seems to get back with me about getting his NCAP route table fixed so he can link in with the rest of the, the, the network, which leaves Midland Bay and Saginaw counties kind of this walled garden unto themselves. So, uh, but that guy is very, very retired and he travels a lot, so you, he never has time when he's home. We'll work something out. So let's see. Uh, da, 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 I think we're done with interoperability. Oh! How many networks are there in the internet? Anybody know? <laughs> the report came out this morning. For the, the, uh, the, the, every Friday, there's an email that comes out on the North American Network Operators Group that says how many networks there are in the internet and how the ASNs are aggregated and all this sort of thing. I, didn't get, I obviously didn't get the email today, and the last one I found in my archives was dated September 7th. There are 770,473 networks in the world on the internet. In, you know, distinct individual networks that had to be announced so that they could be reached. 770,000. And the number goes up by about uh, anywhere from a couple thousand, and I've seen as many as 8,000 new nets occur within one week. It goes through some uh, big spurts sometimes. So when somebody says the internet is down, I can guarantee you, for, uh, just from what I see posted on the NANUG group, that about 5% of the internet is always down. <laughs> There's just so much of it. There's always going to be, we'll just say it's road construction, and everybody here really, really loved all those orange uh, flowers that Michigan puts up on our roads. They're all over the place out here today. The uh, user interface for most users is uh, very, very consistent. If you happen to be on a JNOS node and you want to go and connect to WC8RC-3 and, and you're on a node near him, connect the port number, and we number our ports by the frequency that they're on. It's just kind of informative. Connect 144.93 WC8RC-3, hit enter, and a moment later you get connected to it. So should the syntax be the same if I go over to a BPQ node? Let's hope so, because we want the user interface to be really consistent across all networks. And BPQ did the same thing. Connect port 2, because they don't name their ports, they number them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then the call sign, and you make a down, an AX25 downlink. However, if you're on either a JNOS or BPQ node, and you want to make a NetROM connection, and you know the node name that you want to go to, it's just C space and the node name, in this case, Hamgate Alcona takes me off to, via NetROM, 
uh, to the Alcona node. Or if I'm on a JNOS node and I want to telnet to Hamgate Alcona, I can do a T space Hamgate Alcona. Don't need to go and say .amper.org because after all, they're all .amper.org. And yeah, Hamgate's a long name and then the county name. SMTP email, as I pointed out earlier, flows directly from your station to the destination station over IP, uh, TCP IP. Winlink RMS was really designed around the last mile or the first mile, like sailboats to a, uh, to a uh, shore station and then into the internet. They, they really originally designed around that sort of a model. Um, so being able to come into an RMS server, all an RMS server does is connect your radio to the internet and it, and it sends the data off over the internet to a CMS server, a central mail server. And there are a bunch of them all over the world. Um, so an internet failure could indeed cause WinLink not to work because only the last mile, first mile is, is radio. However, the MI7 guys have got it, uh, got it right by putting their own um, post office server on the microwave network as the first stop for all of their RMS traffic. That was a, that was a slick move. All righty, how am I doing on time? 10, okay, I better speed it up. Who manages the networks? The JNOS AmperNet is uh, primarily uh, managed by the AWRL Michigan Section Digital Radio Group, which, which I've uh, chaired since 2004. Uh, we're mostly there to go and rally interest and, and keep people moving in a common direction towards building out the uh, networks. There's the website for it, www.mi-drg.org. Uh, a lot of resources there for those that go to the website. MI6 Microwave and MI7 BPQ are uh, managed by the Central Michigan Emergency Network, or CMEN. Uh, they have a group of uh, board of directors that manage the operation of the entire network, uh, www.whcmn.net. And then there's everyone else who puts up a BPQ node, uh, private individuals, county ARPC groups, and so forth. By the way, those of you that have Knet no, or um, KPC3 pluses with the right firmware can turn on a thing called Knet, not Knode, but Knet, and it becomes a NetROM node. Did you know that? Is that KA node? No, not KA node. It's just Knet, and not Knode, but Knet. But you have to have a KPC3 Plus with the right firmware in order to turn that on. Um, I will skip over that. I will go and show that there are, uh, no matter which of the uh, networks you hook into, you end up what we lovingly refer to as the alphabet soup prompt. Now certainly, let's see if I get the pointer without pushing any other buttons, You'll see all the commands here are a single letter, one or, one or two letters. That's what you'll see on a JNOS node. They've got lots and lots and lots of commands because they do lots and lots and lots of things. This is a, a typical alphabet soup prompt, which actually has words, RMS, chat, connect, buy, info. Uh, we have uh, C for connect and uh, 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 B for buy and I for info. We use single letters. But it's a, it's a BBS-like uh, interface. And when you're working in a low bandwidth environment, that's important. Uh, the program that we like to push people into using is a thing called Outpost. It is uh, an email client, uh, runs on Windows, will run on Linux under, under Wine, and it handles all the handshaking between your computer through your TNC to your nearby node or, or BBS. And as you can see, looks like your typical uh, mail client, email client. FL Message, uh, FL Message and FL Digi were really meant for HF, but you can use FL Message to go and fill out something like an ICS form. It will give you the output in, in a text format, letting you see what it is it's actually going to send over HF. And then you can cut and paste that into a terminal window on, and, and send it via packet. We did a statewide drill here, uh, was it last year, George, or uh, uh, Steve? It was last year, and that was horrible. That was absolutely horrible. <laughs> That's a bad way to operate. But we got it done, and, and uh, 
Uh, 16 out of 83 counties actually got a message to the state EOC that way. I think there were only 20 participating, so it wasn't that bad a record. Um, Winlink Airmail also supports ICS forms. Um, you merely go and configure this to go and connect with your nearby RMS node, which is usually the call sign of the node dash 10. Most Winlink stations are dash 10. And it'll let you go and connect in and, and pass your mail, and everything's done in the background without you ever, ever knowing, never having to deal with it. A lot of this stuff runs on a simple Raspberry Pi with a Tink Pi mounted on top of it. Everybody's got a Raspberry Pi. $35, you got a Raspberry Pi. $40, bucks, you get a Tink Pi in kit form. It takes 20 minutes to solder it together. Even if you're needing bifocals like me, I can put one together in, in 20 minutes. So uh, awesome, awesome little, uh, uh, little node. Um, it uses the one and only serial port on the Raspberry Pi to go and talk to the Tink Pi. Um, however, what if I want more than one radio port like that? I've got three. I can't use one serial port. Oh, well, the Raspberry Pi uses I squared C. And a lot of programmers in the crowd, you all know what I squared C is. Okay, nobody's raising their hand, but I'll believe that you know it. Yeah, hardware, guys too. Yeah, hardware guys too. But uh, you can go and configure the uh, Raz or the uh, Tink Pies for uh, a specific, you know, unique uh, I squared C addresses, and then they just use the I squared C bus. I've never seen anybody stack more than four or five uh, uh, Tinks onto a single uh, Pi, but that's a lot of radio ports in one location. Um, the, uh, I already covered that about the Tink Pi serial ports. There is a uh, installing JNOS onto a Raspberry Pi. There's a how-to on the DRG website, uh, mi-drg.org. There's configuration files that are in the very next section on that page. Go and show you how to configure it. And I purposely set up those config files for uh, um, W1AW. Anybody guess why I set it for W1AW? So no one would put a node on the air until they were done properly configuring the node. Because people get embarrassed when they go and broadcast W1AW. And I used to go and put them out with my call, and I would see my call in, in, in beacons on, on nodes on the other side of the state. I'd travel around the state, and I'd go and see, uh, see nodes with my call on them. And it's like, dude, you got to fix that. <laughs> I don't mind if they do W1AW, that's on them. Um, and I just, uh, I just finished up this node. This is going to be Hamgate Monroe. Um, I just finished this one up. It is, it, its image, the SD RAM card on this, is uh, Raspberrian Noobs um, with JNOS already compiled, already pre-installed, with WinLink support, with APRS support, with SNMP support, I put everything in it, uh, it's already uh, uh, compiled and pre-installed, and then I went and made some drop-down menus so that you can start and stop the uh, processes through an ungodly awful tool known as System D. Oh, yeah, groan with me, gang, groan with me, System D. Oh. So um, I hope to go and have that completely debugged and, and feeling safe about it, and then I'll put that up on the website so people can just download it, squirt it to an SD RAM, put it in their, in their Pi, boot it up, edit the config file, and they've got a node on, on, online. Um, oh, and did I say JNOS now supports WinLink RMS? All right, yeah. And, uh, it, and it also supports APRS. So where I had three ports on that one box, I could have my local access port, I could have a UHF port, I could have a APRS port, and they could all be working all at the same time on one box because JNOS is the Swiss Army knife of packet. So, Bob Breninga, he did his thing on pushing green energy and solar power and that sort of thing, and you know, we'll, we'll go and do this energy independence and green jobs and, and livable cities and renewables, yay ha, and clean water. What if it's a hoax? Yeah, would we, yeah. We create a better world for nothing. Yeah. By the way, Bob, if you want that slide, I'll send it on to you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, the URLs that I mentioned uh, in the presentation are there on the screen. And did I hit it on the money? <laughs> okay, we've got a question over here. Fred, or uh, excuse me, Jay, uh, I'm Mark, we've been on Q's at B. Yeah. We'd been communicating prior to the DCC about trying to get Fred Moses here yes. to demonstrate the new French NPR IP-based 70 centimeter data radio. We were unsuccessful in that endeavor, apparently. Yep. Fred was busy with a work commitment. But very, my question is, my, mm -hmm. my, my question is, given that it's on 70 centimeters, it looks like a very interesting IP database radio. Do you anticipate experimenting with that here in Michigan more going forward? We will leave that task to Fred. He, uh, he has already purchased, uh, I don't know how many, like a dozen of these things, these nodes, bought up all the parts, built up a bunch. He's had some running, and he has reported back to the DRG that, that they were working really, really well. I think his next step is he wants to go and deploy them on one of his MI7 node sites and then set up a bunch of users and see how that works out. Fred and his, and his crew were unable to be here because there's an MS Bikeathon going on in Michigan that is really, really huge. And I mean, it is a big ordeal for him and his crew to go and deploy and provide the communications for. So he had a conflict in scheduling. We also tried to get the creator, the, the French creator, created here to the DCC. We were unsuccessful in that too, but maybe next year. Yeah, well, you know, there's this money that ARDC is making available. Maybe you can dip into that and get the guy flown out. Yeah. Any other questions? Any questions? And just a, before I go, Show of hands, how many people still have packet radio equipment, whether it be a plain old TNC? Ah, oh, oh, yeah. Put them on the air, guys. Put them on the air. Thank you very much. Thank you.